Hey everybody, CyberTow back with you. Uh, we're continuing our examination of how to fight against hanging pawns. We're going to be switching to looking at how to um, slowly transition to look at how to pressure uh, hanging pawns with purely pieces. Um, almost by necessity, some of the games will still include pawn breaks against hanging pawns because those are so essential to fight against the hanging pawns, but we're going to start transitioning from looking at solely using pawn breaks to immediately pressure hanging pawns to how to maneuver your pieces properly to pressure the hanging pawns in an early middle game. Um, our first example game we're going to use to look at this, uh, Bundarevsky versus Wassily Smyslov. Um, Smyslov is one of the guys I've modeled my play after the most, uh, probably my second favorite world champion uh, behind Petrosian. If you're looking for instructional value of positional play or end games, uh, Smyslov is virtually impossible to beat. He's very harmonious style. Uh, Smyslov is black here, d4, bishop b4. Sort of the perfect opening for Smyslov. This uh, Nimzo is a very harmonious opening in general. The minor pieces are already working together perfectly to control the square e4 uh, without any inefficiency. Um, it's not passive, but it's certainly not like an opening like the King's Indian or the Grunfeld, where one theoretical novelty can completely sink a position with one slip on the precipice. Uh, the Nimzo is a much more conceptual opening than some of their openings, so there's a lot of room for improvisation. You don't feel like you need to memorize 30 moves of theory to play it properly. I play d3. This is the Rubenstein. This is um, still the most popular way of playing. A couple other ways to respond. Queen c2. Um, probably the second most. Uh, White's using his queen to fight for the square e4, and he's threatening e4 in one go. Uh, downside, of course, that White's spending all this time moving his queen, and he'll probably spe uh, spend even more time moving the queen after Bishop takes on c3, because the queen tends to take back on c3. So two moves with the queen, that's a big time investment. Um, but e3, e3 and queen c2 are the two main responses. I would say e3 is still the most popular, the most durable and uh, sound of the two. Uh, D5. So this was popular. This game was played in 1950. Um, even back in 1950, this was still considered a perfectly good way of playing. Now with modern eyes, we see that this just is not accurate. This isn't a proper way of playing the move order. Even on move four, this still sort of gives away the fight for equality for black. Um, modern options. Castles is the most popular and most solid option, I would say. A black, a black's looking for hyper-modern-ish play. B6, in my opinion, is the most aggressive and hyper modern -y way of playing. Uh, the bishop is immediately thinking of dropping the squares like B7 or even A6 to pressure the center. Very much in the spirit of what Nimzovich himself would think about this opening. The problem with D5, and this was only found through trial and error and praxis. A3, so this, this is the correct way of playing. So bishop B7. Um, obviously this is just losing time with the bishop, and it completely gives up the idea of playing that Nimzo, uh, idea of taking the c3 to damage the pawn structure. Uh, Black is gonna say that he's got white to commit to e3, so it's like a queen's gambit declined, where in exchange for the invested tempo from Black, white has locked his queen bishop in prematurely. But this is a lot of time, in my, in my opinion, Black. White is slightly better here, just because he gains a lot of time against that black square bishop. The problem is, taking in c3, castle, cx d5, this is the key move. If white were to play something like bishop d3, then uh, black would win that tempo that we often see in like, the queen's game decline. And this is a perfectly fine position for black. This is back into much safer waters. Uh, but taking in d5 saves that tempo. Bishop d3, key move, develop bishop on its natural diagonal, c5, and then this is especially the key move, knight e2. This is why this line is so good for white. If white were forced to play knight f3, black would actually be much better here. And black has a crippling light square blockade, this is much better for black. Uh, knight e2... It prevents that light square blockade from forming because white still has the pawn available to move to f3. And this is a supercharged same-ish variation against the Nimzo Indian. White has a very simple plan of just playing f3, e4, and then crashing through in the center. 
and modern praxis has shown that there's really not much that black can do about it. The game that showed this was Botvinnik Capablanca Avro 1938. So that model game was played 12 years before 1950, but even 12 years after that, theory moved incredibly slow, so they were still working out the implications of that game. They weren't sure whether the mistake was much earlier in the game or there was a way for Capablanca to hold on. Now with modern eyes, we see that this position is just not very good for black. You know, white has the bishop pair. White has the availability to march into the center quite easily with f3 and e4. And black just doesn't have enough compensation for those two factors. Um, which is why d5 itself is objectionable. So bishop e7 avoids that, but loses a lot of time with that bishop. Now to 3, c5 is another way of playing. Um... Oh, just an aside, since it involves the name of Bobby Fischer. Um, Bishop d6 was a weird choice of uh, Fischer against Petrosian in the 1959 candidates. Um, Petrosian played knight of 3, which is a mistake, should play c5 immediately, but uh, Fischer gave him another chance, and then Petrosian, of course, took it. Um, of course, this is just losing time, even more time, with the dark squared bishop, but Petrosian just squeezed Fischer to death here. Um, C5 is less good here because it's not gaining that time against a bishop on d6. Breaking against the queen side, and then a5. And then black is immediately putting pressure in this queen side structure. Black has an idea of playing bishop a6 to get that bad light square bishop off the board for him, and rob white of his good white square bishop. Um, I would say white's slightly better, but this is still a perfectly good. This, this is still a struggle. Uh, knight f3 is better, just continues development. Castle. Should be 3. b6, black can take. You know, he gains that tempo against light square bishop. Um, but this is a very nice queen's gambit accepted for white, because black lost that time with his dark square bishop earlier. So this is the sort of position white would get, um, except black would have another one or two moves in development. Here. So only white can be better here. This is, this is a very nice position for white. Uh, b6 just sort of holds things in stasis. Castle. c5 challenging for the center. Queen e2. I don't want to take up too much of the video. Uh, as usual, the notes will be... The annotated game will be in the notes. 65 is another option. Um, in this sort of position, this is a little bit better for white. Nothing spectacular, but white's going to slowly reorganize his knights to drift over to the king side for some sort of pressure. Um, he's already got he already has his bishops lined up nicely against the black king side. He can bring his knights into the like this knight can hop to g3 and threaten to hop to f5. This knight's already ready to hop into e5 and provide some pressure. Um, it's nothing drastic, but only white can be better here. White's quite comfortable. Uh, but queen e2 is also standard. Rook d1, take in c5 immediately is probably best. And then it's locking black in with the hanging pawns. They're not a great hang they're not a horrible hanging pawn for black, but they're also not great. Um, especially since black lost that time earlier. This what black really should have another one or two moves of development in this position. Uh, but rook d1, there's nothing wrong with it. Um then bishop a6. Now, this is something that's concretely wrong with rook d1, is that it allows this resource. And as always, I've always talked about this moment of transition, where the moment where the hanging pawns or the isolated pawns are created is so key, that you need to immediately establish pressure against the hanging pawns, or immediately establish pressure against the isolated pawn. If you don't establish that pressure, you're going to let the sign with the hanging pawn or the isolated pawn build up for free. Just get a pressure for gratis. And you get nothing for it because you don't have counterplay of your own. Um, here, Smeasel doesn't fall in for this. Bishop a6, it solves this light square bishop. Because you look at this, bishop on c8, it doesn't have any other squares. But bishop a6, it perfectly employs it. Immediately gets that bishop to work, and it's pressuring that key c pawn. Uh, so, excellent move from Smeasel. This gains his share of the play b3 reinforces. White can also head for an isolated queen pawn. This is equal, but it's the sort of equal or only black can ever win this. 
Um, this is a prospectless isolated queen pawn for uh, white. Uh, he's already lost his light square bishop. That means typically when you've lost your light square bishop with an isolated queen pawn is white, most of your attacking chances go with it. That is such a key piece for attacking chances quite usually. Um, and here, uh, black has very harmonious developments. You know, black just doesn't have any problems here. This is a very nice position. B3 keeps more tension in the position. Rook c8, building up pre more pressure in the c-file, that's correct. Rook b1, queen c7. This unnecessarily exposes the black queen, so this queen is just going to be sitting on the c-file where it could potentially be hit by knight b5 or eventually a rook in the c-file. Uh, h6 just restricts the bishop on c1 and the knight, knight on f3. And then knight a5. This is exactly how you want to play these positions. And it's why... When you're playing against the hanging pawns as black, often a knight will be better on c6 than on d7. Because on c6, it can actually hop to a5 to pressure the hanging pawns. Whereas on d7, it just doesn't really have all that much to do. Um, but queen c7 ex potentially exposes the black queen. Knight b5 immediately hits the queen. So notice that black really can't take. The knight sort of has to hop back to this embarrassing square. And then, let's say bishop g5. This is a, a very superb position for white. You know, white's got the bishop pair. He can still advance these queenside pawns for extra space. He's going to immediately hop on the c-file and gain that. He can play his bishop back to g3 to harass this black queen. Um, white, white's in superb shape here. He's much, much better. Uh, queen bait's depressing, but it's necessary. Bishop g5, still the same idea, but potentially dropping the bishop back to g3. Or knight h5. So this this is necessary. The knight needs to stop that maneuver to, for the bishop going to g3. But it's also very common in these sorts of positions because you want to develop that counterplay and pressure white so it doesn't develop play for free. So knight h5. And it's another example of where those sayings about the knight on the rim being grinned sort of break down as useless anecdotes. Like where you don't play words, you play moves in chess. And if the moves show something that's correct, it doesn't matter what a saying says. So knight h5, completely correct here. Uh, bishop takes, this is a little bit accurate. Bishop g3 would be best. It's more solid. It, bringing this pawn from h2 to g3 is actually a gain because it controls that f4 square. Um, and it keeps all of white's pieces in fairly active uh, positions. This bishop on e7 really isn't a huge asset. Um, whereas after bishop c 7 it sort of forces black to play a good move. You know, he, He's happy to play this knight back to e7 where it's sort of reorganizing to help pressure these soon-to-be hanging pawns. 95, this is an accurate g3's best, taking that square under direct guard. Um, and I would say white, black is slightly better here, just because these are going to be hanging pawns, and it's a pretty nice hanging pawn for black, um, but it limits the advantage. Whereas 95, 9 f6 is the mistake. Um, again, I don't want to go too far into the variations, but there is a direct direct line for an advantage here for black. Taking c4 is simply correct. So, it attacks the bishop on d3, so the knight on h5 is safe from hanging. Knight f4, this is all tactical play. This is probably why Smyslov didn't play this, because he didn't probably didn't see a certain tactical nuance here. If I had to guess, I would guess that Smyslov didn't notice it here. Bishop c4 went to pawn. Because uh, otherwise, this variation looks quite nice for black. Um, this is my main variation after dxc4. Just to reiterate, that's where this position comes from. Uh, and not only is black slightly better, but this is the sort of slightly better we can just play forever. You know, we've got three sets of minor pieces off the board. That always favors the side fighting the hanging pawns. The, side, the hanging pawns here don't have the sort of kingside activity to justify the theoretical pawn weaknesses. This is... Um, and black can play forever here. He can just get his rooks to the D and C file and just slowly start pressuring. There's not much that white can do. Uh, Nine of six gives all of that away. A4. So this is back to equal, and this is a very common move with the hanging pawns, especially because you're creating A5 as your own uh, pawn break resource to create counterplay. So, plus, bishop xb5 isn't a resource now because the A pawn will simply take back, and black hasn't created any pawn weaknesses. Uh, knight c6, f4, this is too loosening. 
Knight takes his best. It's sort of a... You generally don't like this sort of simplification, but white actually has a very nice position here. So two sets of minor pieces are off the board, but white's pieces are much better mobilized. You know, all of white's pieces are basically perfectly placed, and these pawns are incredibly mobile. Both d5 and c5 are positional threats here. Um, this is a very, a very nice position for white. These hanging pawns are a complete asset here. f4, just a little bit too loosening. There, there's no hope of a king's side attack here, just because white doesn't... If white had both his rooks lined up against the king side, that would be something. But white just doesn't have any firepower the power range against the black king side. So f4 doesn't make as much sense. Uh, knight b4, simply taking. Except the dare. Force, force white to prove that he has compensation here. Um, and this is the key resource, just hitting this white queen first. Um, black is simply better. You know, this knight on c6 is nice, but a pawn is a pawn. You know, and black after uh, queen c7 on the next move can play his own moves, like knight e4 can develop his own play. Uh, knight b4 just is too passive. He should be taking the dare and taking the pawn. f5. Queen d6. a5. So this is sort of the position that I want to focus on for this game, because um, it's one of those key resources that often comes up in these hanging pawn positions. Uh, especially since a a4, a5 is often a key resource for the side with the hanging pawns to create the own uh, a pawn weakness in the enemy camp that they can focus on themselves. Um, but here, Smyslov plays the correct move. He plays b5. And this is 100% correct. Um, notice that taking an a5 is simply um, this might be objectively equal, but practically, I think white's going to be much better every single day of the week. Um, black's pawn structure is completely shattered. Um, both of these white knights are better than either, certainly either of the black minor pieces, but certainly the bishop on b7. Bishop on b7 really doesn't have anything left to hit. Um, this is the sort of position where white can play for free forever. And he's going to win more than a share of games. B5 immediately is... It's a dynamic pawn push. Not even a pawn sacrifice, but just a pawn push meant to immediately fight for a black share of the game. Uh, and it does so successfully. So C5, the tactical point. Knight takes. This is all pretty much force. And this pin, this pin on the knight on b3, uh, b5 is completely devastating. This is one potential line. And there's no defense here, because now we've just replaced the uh, one pin on the knight on b5 with another. The knight on b5 can't move, because then the, bishop on, uh, the knight on d3 would hang. Uh, there's a couple other lines in here. Uh, give it a look yourself. But it shows that white simply can't take in uh, b5. So c5 is played. That's correct. Queen d8. So white has two pass pawns here, and this will off this often happens when black makes this choice to play b5 against white hanging iso uh, white's hanging pawns. Um, but he is completely compensated for that those two hanging pawns by having a very nice blockade on the light squares. Um, neither of these pawns can really successfully move because of this monster bishop on b7, and black's going black has his own play. He's threatening moves like b4 to chase this knight away. The pawn on a5 is hanging. Uh, this is a very dynamic position. It's hard for both uh, players to manage this position because it is a very ragged position for both sides. Uh, rook a1. This is already a nearly a decisive mistake. Don't passively defend. Don't passively defend. If you're passively defending, it's usually almost always wrong. It, that, that should be some sort of a last resort for most of your positions. You want to be actively fighting for your share of the play. Knight e2 is correct. Uh, just getting the knight into the thick of things. Notice that queen takes is wrong here. Because c6. And black is a pawn up. Uh, but it's a really ragged pawn. Because uh, this bishop on a8 is suddenly very unhappy. This pawn on c6 is an incredibly strong pass pawn. Um, eventually white's going to threaten just playing king h1 and d5. And those two protected pass pawns will just shut out half of black's army. Um, in the meantime, knight f5 and queen g3 is simply threatens. And that's an overwhelming mating attack. Um, 
one example line, take an a5 is wrong, so bishop d5. And this is a very tense position. This is dead equal. It's probably just going to liquidate down to a draw. But still a very dead, e dead even in tense position. Uh, but knight e2 is simply better. White needs to be creating his own threats and developing his own play. You know, rerouting that knight to the king's side to threaten mating attacks. Instead of just putting a rook in the corner to defend this weak a-pawn. e4. Knight e2. Yet another mistake. Knight e4 is correct now because has to get this knight into the game on b6 to help hold things together. And this is one potential line. Um, black is down a pawn, but black has excellent compensation. This bishop on b7 is still a monster. Um, and that uh, pass b pawn for black is quite strong as well. Uh, but 92, uh, too little too late. So bishop b4, this is an important tempo game. And suddenly this is another drawback to the knight e2 move instead of knight e4. Because now this pawn is starting to just steam down the board very quickly. b3, and now black already has a threat of playing b2. This is nearly decisive. So queen c3 is forced. He has to stop b2 from being played. And this is truly an ugly move. Because now the queen is just stuck in this corner. Um, sealed off from the rest of the board. Babysitting this past b pawn. This is a winning position. E5, active play, excellent. Knight um, of three, notice that knight of four doesn't work here. Uh, White's position is completely collapsing. This is decisive. Knight of three, rook f8. Um, this is something I always emphasize in virtually every game we look at, but when you look at the games of the greats, the thing that they always do is finish their development. It's very rare to see a game by a Botvinnik or a Smyslov or a Fisher, and you see half of their pieces just sitting around the corner doing nothing. The games of the greats, you see that quite often the, the decisive move is they just choose to develop the rest of their pieces. And so it is here with Smyslov. He just chooses to mobilize his his other rook to defend that on an e3 and develop more pressure on White's position. And here, that's simply enough to create a decisive position. Okay, c1. Rook c6 is a little bit sloppy, knight c4 is best. And this white queen is suddenly extraordinarily unhappy. Um, queen f5. So this this is a, a little bit sloppy from Smyslov, but um, Smyslov's win is never in doubt. Uh, he chose to liquidate down to this ending, but this is a winning end game, just because this queen is stuck babysitting the b-pawn, so it White is going to have to make so many concessions for the fact that his queen can't be traded off or can't really move. Um, I'll go through the rest of the moves just uh, for completion's sake. Five. Queen c4. Uh, Bondarescu finally resigned. If the king moves to b1, that's mate coming. King moves to d2, it's queen e2, and then the knight in e1 is going to hang. Um, but excellent games from Smyslov. Really, the, the key position that I want you to focus on, the maneuvering leading up to this position, was quite interesting. I definitely want you to look at that as well. But look at this moment right here. So that, that b5 move is a very common decision when fighting against the hanging pawns, especially when... The side with hanging pawns has gotten the a5 pawn break in. Because uh, the a5 pawn break is a, a very common positional device for the side with hanging pawns to try to torpedo the defending side's pawn structure. Um, this b pawn break is so important because it the hanging pawns are at their best when they're standing abreast to one another and defending all the squares in front of them. That b5 pawn break looks to shatter that pawn control in front of the hanging pawns to it. So where instead of two strong pawns next to each other defending all the squares in front like a pin cushion or a hedgehog. Um, the pawns, their control is broken. So you see c5 is the right move here, but suddenly there's all these light squares that the hanging pawns don't control anymore. And these pawns are vulnerable to blockade. That's why that b-pawn break is often such a good positional idea. 
against hanging pawns because it creates those weaknesses that you can start to blockade and exploit when you're fighting against the hanging pawns. Often, even if the speed pawn is a sac pushes a sacrifice, it's a good idea because you want that enhanced control against the hanging pawns. You want to be able to blockade them and turn them into a weakness. Um, and the rest of the game here, Smyslov did an outstanding job. Uh, Bondareski, he was no slouch, uh, but Smyslov's technique at this point was very difficult to deal with. Um, so, excellent game. We're going to continue our examination of hanging pawns. We're going to be looking more at peace uh, pressure against the hanging pawns next time. Uh, my name is John. I'll see you later.